Okay, welcome everybody. Let's make a start. Uh, dear friends and colleagues, I welcome you to today's third sustainability series lecture by Andrea Rinaldo. Andrea trained as a civil engineer in Italy at the University of Padova, after which he undertook his uh, PhD at Purdue University in the US, which he completed in 1983. Uh, in his career, he has held numerous academic appointments, uh, including Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Padova, Visiting Professor at MIT and Princeton, Distinguished Visiting Fellow at Texas A&M and at Purdue. Uh, here, at, uh, here at EPFL, since 2008, he has directed the ECHO Hydrology Lab in the Institute of Environmental Engineering. Andrea's research was most recently recognized by the award of the Stockholm Water Prize, uh, which is considered the highest honor in the world in the area of water resources. Andrea has been elected to national learned societies in Italy, Sweden, Norway, and the, and the US. In the US, he's, he is a foreign member of both the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the, it's, it's unlikely that there's anyone else in the world who is a foreign member of the uh, premier learned societies of the US. Uh, before introducing Andrea's research, it's necessary to understand a little about hydrology. In short, hydrology is concerned with all aspects of the water cycle, from the global scale to the poor scale. At the large scale, the basic hydrological unit is the catchment. As we all know, surface water uh, is directed uh, downhill by gravity. It enters rivulets, channels, streams, rivers, and eventually makes its way to the sea. Water is the catchment's defining characteristic, as well as its lifeblood, as well as the lifeblood of the life within it, an aspect which Andrea fully appreciates. So how do river networks form? Precipitation leads to overland flow, which causes erosion. Local erosion concentrates the flow, which causes more erosion. Then we get small channels, they meet and form larger channels and eventually form rivers. Uh, decades ago, geomorphologists found remarkable uh, geometrical similarities between river networks and deduced scaling, scaling laws that describe them. Uh, these laws are usually in the form of power laws and relate such quantities as upstream channel length and drainage area. Uh, can you show the image? Uh, just across from us is the Po River catchment, which you can see here. You can see the intricate detail of the channel network, which is produced by erosion. So the question is, how do sub, such net, networks form, and what can we say about their structure? If plate tectonics leads to increasing land elevation, then flow-driven erosion by river networks is the mechanism that removes them. What can we say about the geometrical structure of these river networks? Given that river networks are formed by processes that can be understood on the basis of physical laws, it makes sense that we can characterize them in a systematic way. Uh, to answer this question, how, that is how we do it, we need only, only look to Andrea. In 1997, with uh, co-author uh, Rodriguez Aturbe, he published his book, Fractal River Basins, Chance and Self-Organization, which is required reading for students on this topic. The book's title sets the stage. First, the word fractal tells us that the level of detail is multi-layered. Second, the word chance tells us that the behavior is something that we uh, cannot be certain of. And third, the term uh, self-organization tells us that there are common features of river networks that are embedded uh, even in the most complex manifestations that we may find in nature. Uh, more specifically, Andrea shows how to combine fractal concepts, optimal channel networks, and self-organized criticality, criticality to understand uh, the features of river networks. So if we look at the Poe catchment, 
Uh, it's not surprising that fractals could describe such a system. However, a fractal description by itself doesn't give us real insight. Um, after all, fractals are patterns. Uh, what Andrea provides us is a missing insight in his use of optimal channel networks. These refer to networks which are produced by minimum rates of energy expenditure. Andrea shows us how the connectivity between the elevation structure of river networks can be explained by optimal channel networks. The key physical principle explaining this structure is that minimum energy dissipation leads to self-similar characteristics of, of our networks such as we see here. Now at this point you can look at this screen and wonder if there isn't more to this story. Interesting that it is. In particular, while river networks can be considered as a fundamental characteristic of any catchment, are they that only a characteristic? What do river networks tell us about vegetation patterns? What do they tell us about organisms living in that catchment? What do they say about ecological systems more generally? What control, if any, is exerted by the river network on ecological form and function? What is the connection between the river network, catchment morphology, and ecological systems? In short, if we can answer this question, then we can understand a lot about how catchments function. Uh, indeed, Andrea has considered such questions and provided many answers in his 2020 book entitled River Networks as Ecological Corridors, Species, Populations, Pathogens, co-authored with Gatto and again, Rodriguez Aturbe. Uh, we should not understand that, uh, the challenge that Andrea and his colleagues address in this book. Natural ecosystems are hugely diverse and hugely complex, with striking variations in form and function. Never the, nevertheless, at least some features of, ec of ecological systems are structurally similar on different spatial and temporal scales. As given in the book title, Andrea considers river networks as, ec as ecological corridors that have a quantifiable effect on distributions of species and populations. Is the effect major? Put, it, put another way, does the landscape, which is defined by the river network, provide a first order control on aspects of, for instance, species distribution, or does that control from the, under, from the underlying ecosystem? This is an important fundamental question. But such questions are only examples that underpin the issues that Andrea opens in linking river networks to ecological functioning. Biodiversity is fundamental to any ecological system. And to understand biodiversity is necessary to understand population dynamics, which Andrea shows is linked to, indeed, the connectivity, the connectivity of riverine systems. Still, one can go even further. How do river networks affect waterborne disease? Andrea has tackled this question by combining hydrological and human mobility networks. I'll stop here, but before uh, welcoming Andrea to the stage, I'd like to remark that before Andrea, there was hydrology, there was ecology, with a relatively small overlap in terms of fundamental theoretical understanding. Andrea is a pioneer in creating this understanding, which has been empirically validated now many times. It's therefore fitting that we acknowledge his role in creating the discipline of what we now call echo-hydrology. Andrea, I welcome you to the stage. The floor is yours. So beautiful. Thank you so much for a beautiful introduction. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for this beautiful and very generous introduction, which I, I wish I could explain it as well as you did, actually. So, <laughs> so big, great, or small, uh, our discovery uh, uh, talks about the journey we embarked on uh, uh, without uh, the faintest idea on whether the, uh, the, the was success was at the end of it, accompanied by institutions, accompanied by colleagues and students. And what a marvelous journey has been this uh, at EPFL for me in these uh, 16 and 17 when I will retire uh, at EPFL. Uh, because I, I have to say that um, it is because of a, uh, of a research infrastructure that TPFL uh, gave me that uh, I could actually, that was recognizing my motivation of the prize. So I'm very humbled and proud of, uh, of what um, 
uh, uh, I've got uh, from, from this wonderful institution. And um, uh, the story of our research, the story of the of uh, questions we ask, uh, more than the answers, uh, imperfect and incomplete as they inevitable, inevitably are, but we contrive. And um, so this is uh, what I'll be doing today in this conversation about uh, water, if you want development, resilience, inequality. It's a set of questions and how we uh, embark in trying to answer them. And um, this is what uh, I'll be doing today. Reflecting water, in fact, uh, uh, means uh, a lot. It's a title of a book, one of the greatest haters of uh, hydraulic engineers, Colin Ward. Um, it uh, um, reminds us of a painting by Caravaggio of Narcissus and Narcissism, and we know very well that EPFL is a fundamental component of our profession. And uh, you remember the book by Bruno Lemaitre, of course. And um, but reflecting water means that there's something we can read in water, actually. And the, the, the kind of question that I'm showing you, this picture was taken in Bangladesh, where um, uh, my lab was doing field work. And the simple question is, will this guy, this young fellow, catch cholera? Uh, it seems like a, a, a semi a, 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 an idiotic question, but if you think that this happened like 200 meters downstream of the largest real hospital in the world, in which there are something like 400 uh, uh, patients of cholera, in the place from which, um, evolutionally speaking, cholera um, uh, uh, evolved and from then irradiated uh, uh, worldwide, uh, the odds of predicting such a simple question, you catch cholera if you ingest uh, um, a number of pathogens in a simple lump of water, like this guy was doing, showing me that the mighty waters of the Magna, one of the tributaries of a great uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, uh, Deltaic region, the mighty waters couldn't be the source of the thing. Like in the times of John Snow in London, the Victorian doctor who realized that it wasn't the air, but it was the water that would carry the thing. Anyways, uh, the simple question, uh, it's fraught with so many odds and so many uncertainties that the weakness of our capability to predict such a stupid and simple, uh, a stupid and simple outcome uh, it's complicated to think. The, con the, uh, the point-wise concentration in space and time of the thing with uncertain boundary conditions because you don't know what's the leakage, which is obvious leakage, of course, from the sewer system of a hospital, the hydrodynamic dispersion into the system and the evolution of the concentration of the thing up to the point in which the guy in that moment in time was thinking, that liability is a permanent weakness. But um, uh, we have, we had, I wish to say, on predicting the value of ecosystem surfaces, in this case, um, uh, drinking water. But uh, this picture takes us to sub-Saharan Africa, in which uh, uh, EPFL has a long tradition of collaboration, in particular in this part in Burkina Faso, um, starting from my predecessor. Uh, I've been, in fact, we've been doing work in that particular part, of, in, in that particular region of the world. And um, um, questions that come to mind is, will large-scale water resources management of the future, be including uh, as, a, as a binding requirement the protection of biodiversity, is a river network per se, the template of uh, uh, the disease, uh, the waterborne disease that can affect uh, that particular country, is uh, the written somewhat reflected in water through the shape of the river basin, the uh, uh, population and human migrations, including the Neolithic transitions that shape the position of the human communities where we see them today. And, um, and uh, this is the, 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 uh, the kind of question that you ask. And, um, Africa, in a sense, is the symbol of our responsibility, a master of contemporary thought, especially on African matters. Jonathan Ledgard, who was at EPFL, visiting professor while I was here, and uh, who became a very dear friend of mine, um, said something which struck me uh, very much. He said uh, a few years back that within 15 to 20 years in Africa, 800 million people will live in cities that do not exist yet. Within 15 to 20, not 150 to 200. And the test of our capabilities to convince people about the reduction of inequalities will mean that uh, we won't be able to go to the root of the problem which is upon us, which is climate change, which is our fault, in which we hinge on mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation goes to the root causes. It's complicated to tell people uh, now to do what we had done in the past. And uh, Africa is going to be the symbol of our responsibilities, in fact, in the future. 
I think. But other questions come to mind. This is still from the same place. Um, in, in Burkina Faso, the World Bank uh, financed 15,000 small dams to accumulate water, small uh, storages, because they have very peculiar um, hydrologic uh, and climatic regime, which I will not uh, paste you. But essentially, they have a sizable amount of water in a very limited amount of time, and the rest is like uh, equatorial or tropical climate in much of the thing. So these, um, these small ponds uh, just, uh, of course, store the water when there's excess and distribute it when there's uh, the scarcity. And um, so they gave way to a huge number of irrigation canals in that region. They greatly enhanced uh, the, uh, the gross domestic product of Burkina Faso, visibly. What they did not show is the fact that uh, the construction of those waterways also meant an immense expansion of a range of a, a poverty-reinforcing, debilitating disease, a neglected disease called Billard-Sose or schistosomiasis, which is uh, generated by expanding the range of intermediate host, mandatory, obligatory um, host of an of a, uh, intermediate host for the cycle of a, of a pathogen. And that meant that um, it's very clear, and that goes to the root of a uh, of the evaluation of ecosystem services, material and material values. We can certainly see very well economic indicators like gross domestic products, the advantage of what you have done. But you cannot put a price tag on the disability uh, 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 lost uh, workforce of a cognitive impairing and poverty reinforcing disease that the thing has spread. There is uncontroversial evidence. This is a group of, a wonderful group, expert or she's the best group of expert toxicosomiasis based in Switzerland, the Swiss Tropical Institute, in fact, show that the correlation is beyond any doubt. So there is a direct correlation between what we have done, meaning well. But the consequences, it means that the natural capital has to be evaluated, and no economy can thrive and thrive forever unless we take into account properly economic indicators and the natural capital. And that goes back to my my beloved Venice. This is a landform in the, in the Venice Lagoon, my, uh, where I was born and, and, and raised. And um, uh, just only to mention quickly that um, ecosystem services can be varied, of course. Um, one, some of them are cultural services. Beauty is a cultural service. Imagine you that um, a debate which is at the heart of development thinking against uh, environmental thinking Development thinking, part of the group that I will mention in that, says that it's stacked against nature. So we cannot think in terms of development, not anymore. But what happens in, uh, in this case is that um, you know, as a matter of fact, that within 80 to 100 years, those wonderful landforms will be gone. By natural phenomena, by sea level rise, the fact that this beautiful pinkish vegetation which you see is the halophytes, halophytic vegetation whose zonation is, a, is more precise than a leader or lidar map of the elevation of, a, of those relatively flat land. That means that uh, once the tide will become uh, the hydro period, that is the number of hours in which the, uh, the, the landform will remain underwater, will exceed the level of the suffocation of the plant. Once the plant is gone, the, the, the landform is gone as well. So what is the message? You have to fight for your ecosystem services if you think they are worth. You have to work for it. But there is still a hardcore environmentalism that wants nature to do its course, whatever it is. Mind you that in the Lagoon of Venice, there's nothing natural. Without man's intervention 500 years ago, it would have disappeared. And that brings me to the, uh, the pricing of the planet. We are all under the spell, the first spell, of what um, Proust used to say about uh, works that um, carry a theory. It's like a gift on which you forgot the price tag for something pricing that we don't like, etc. Yet, if something is priceless, it is worth nothing in economic terms. So pricing the environment is key. And what part of this group, the, the guy you're seeing here, the Cambridge economist, wrote very clear is that economic indicators that omit the depletion of a natural capital do not give a sense of the wealth and the poverty of nations. 
If you make way, if you drain a, a, a wetland to make way for a commercial activity, you will certainly see in the GDP of that area, the improvement brought to the GDP by employment, uh, whatever, uh, and, and any measure of reach. But you don't see the value. You cannot really properly account yet, to date, the ecosystem services you lost forever. And um, that brings you to something which I very much uh, uh, like, in fact. We, another spell we're under, very clearly, is the spectre of the Kutznetz curves. Kutznet was a, an expatriate of a Nazi Germany and who got the Nobel Prize later on, was a professor at Harvard, that um, produced those curves, which are called the Kutznet curves, in which essentially on the x-axis, that's the only technical thing I allow myself to, to think, it's a diagram, x and y. x and y, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and um, in the x-axis, you have... Um, GDP, a measure of uh, richness, in a sense, economic indicators. And on the y-axis, you have inequalities or ecosystem services, if you want. And what Kutznet said was this curve was hump-shaped. So in a phase in which initially you have a, a growth of inequalities with the richness, it's followed by a phase in which they start with their well-being, you start decreasing. So that gives ammunition to the development thinking in uh, retaining the idea that, okay, let's get richer. Let's get richer. And uh, things will mend in the end. Then enter Thomas Piketty. If you read uh, the Capital and the 21 e Siècle, its uh, first 30 pages are absolutely breathtaking. That is absolutely terrifying, boring. But it's a very significant thing. He reviewed, in fact, Kutznet's curves. And he found out a very important thing, which is, it's not that Kutznet was wrong, but he was working with economies that were recovering after the catastrophes, like the Second World War, or earthquakes, or epidemics. And they do not reflect the steadiness, the steady state of societies. The point is that as um, rich gets richer, inequalities increase. And that's, that's an important uh, thing, etc. But enters something which I'll be talking about in a minute, about self-organizing systems, which is something which we got very enthusiastic on, and that something which part of a small discovery that landed this prize. Um, the idea that um, open dissipative systems with a huge number of degrees of freedom, like economies, rivers, sand piles, you name it, it's a template of how much of nature works, tend to self-organize into states which are statistically alike, regardless of initial conditions, regardless of parameters, parameters I'm talking to model, as many of you are, um, or uh, quenched randomness, which to disturb it at random, things tend to do exactly the same thing. Creation without God, the evolutionist said. Meaning that the system, rather than having a different outcome every time, it goes inevitably, no matter the zillions of possible combinations you have, your adjacent possible could be anything, we go into the same state, statistically speaking, in what actually matters. So in reality, what happens, if a distribution of, a, of an individual richness is a power law, it's a simple calculation we, we, we offer the students in water resources engineering, I don't know if there are probably quite a few of them here, what you say that 80% of a, in, in a, in a steady state of those economies where we tend, 80% of the richness is the hand of a 20% of the richest people. So it's the, I mean, the template, the manifest of inequalities. And that's something on which uh, uh, we'll have to reflect. And um, this um, uh, gets us to the river networks, believe it or not. Why? Because we do have tools to objectively, uh, uh, to remotely acquire, acquire and objectively manipulate information about the world surrounding us. So you have something where it's like you take a Google map pictures in which you start filtering the vegetation which you have to have because the accuracy is such that uh, now you have to go to the elevations which to the size of a stamp, an elevation which you can calculate over huge distances of the order of a few centimeters. So vegetation matters, you have to filter it and we know very well, by the way, our remote sensing uh, groups uh, are at EPFL are absolutely topping the charts. So you get, get uh, landforms with exquisite details, and you can do that um, from the scale. This is a trick, by the way, for two reasons, which I'll tell you, but I like it so much. Um, you can generate and study landforms from the scale of a few centimeters, or say of a meter, roughly speaking, to thousands of kilometers. And that means that we have to cover 
how nature works of a six orders of magnitude talking about that particular, that particular features of self-organization which, which is embedded in those scaling laws that is scaling invariant laws, means that you are able to observe reliably and testably over several orders of magnitude to see if the process is exactly the one that has features that you will see forever. The trick is that first, this is not a river network, this is a tidal network, which is a somewhat different thing and every hydraulic hydrologist would know that. The second is it looks like a picture, but it's not. It's a digital terrain maps with false colors in which we kind of trick the eye to show marvels, to highlight marvels and landforms. And, and this I show it always because that was the first one we dug out when digital terrain maps were there in their infancies and then you were talking about something like 30 by 30 meters with an accuracy of half a meter in the other direction. This is a small catchment, etc. But there is one message that comes across very clearly. Can you tell me whether this is a, uh, the Chamberon in its high, pla in high place? Okay, there are limits to a certain point, so geomorphologists will excuse me if I simplify too much. But essentially, um, can you tell me whether this is the Chamberon or the Amazon if I took out the scale bar? Because I challenge you, you cannot. Nature provides those forms in a statistically identical shape, regardless of the size. And that's something which uh, we got into a business which is much larger than hydrology early on, because the best tools they had, astrophysicists, cover four orders of magnitude with something which is proxies of a proxies of proxies, super nice, of course, etc. Or physics uh, databases cover, say, three to four, at least two, but three to four orders of magnitude, scales, as you call them. We cover six, verifiable, something can go on the ground, and you can see whether this was correct or not. So this put hydrology, for the first time, into a game bigger than, than its thing. And, and, and I was grateful to what Andrew said before, because um, what were the origins of that, um, of that uh, capability to do exactly regardless of any condition you have? The system was to get into a steady state, get into a system. This is a false network. This is a, an, an optimal channel network. Something which, what we found out, and was a theoretical thing we cared very much for, is that uh, what was initially an assumption, let's see what happens, and, um, and we say, well, it's too beautiful. It cannot be true. It cannot be wrong, I'm sorry. It has, has to be. But what it turns out that this property of a steady state of a general landscape evolution uh, uh, equation, I'm talking slightly more technical, under reparametrization invariance and in the limit of a small grained approximation, uh, this is an exact result. So it's not an approximation. That's what nature does, in fact. Uh, that's, uh, and um, so we can generate forms. The, the, adjacent neighbor, as we say, in evolution, which you haven't seen, actually. And, um, and so it's time to go, as, and I'm grateful for, for what um, Andrew said about it. I'm, I'm, um, I want to honor uh, my friend Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe, uh, easily the best hydrologist ever, who passed away in, in uh, last October, in fact who was at the center of this process of realizing that those features uh, belong in the class of, of self-organized critical processes, um, echoing, uh, uh, I'm showing two books and two contributions which I found particularly important. In the, in the uh, uh, upper picture, you see Benoit Mendelbrot and, uh, and uh, uh, the reproduction of his book on fra the, the fractal geometry of nature, a book which overturned. It's a completely orthogonal to thinking, um, which I deeply admired. It wasn't, he wasn't the nicest of persons, in fact, so he had quite a few enemies because of it. But, but the importance of his work has to be recognized. Uh, mountains are not cones. Clouds are not spheres. Coastline are not simply broken lines. Uh, nor does lightning travel in straight lines. What he found I mean, factually demonstrating it, we have looking with the wrong eyes at the geometry of nature for 3,000 years after Euclid. That is, the shape of the things are neither lengths, costs are not lengths, are not areas, are some in between. The fractal geometry of nature is it's, it's the language of nature whose mathematical language was available, but was clearly discovered by Benoit Mendelbert. So it was um, the grammar for understanding the geometry of nature 
but uh, through Mandelbaum's work we have found out, and we have found the measures for finding out those similarities, which in the past, in fact, in those generations of, of networks, the paradigm was the neutral paradigm, that is, nature creates equally likely shapes. All networks are equally likely. And um, uh, certain shapes are recurrent just because there are too many that look like that one. Well, the paradigm of self-organized criticality and the paradigm of, uh, of uh, what you see in here is that that's absolutely false. There's chance and necessity. And necessity is the minimum energy dissipation, but if the system goes towards a certain stability. The guy on the back, uh, the guy on the back he died very early, he was already sick here, is Per Bach, he's the father of self-organized criticality, who wrote the modestly titled book you see in there, How Nature Works. And um, he, in fact, formalized this idea that there is some ingredient, which applies very much to, uh, to, the, channel, to, the, to the river networks, which characterizes the system that belong in that class. I repeat, open dissipative, dissipative system with zillions of possibilities of doing different things. And yet we do always the same. And down in the process is the robustness where we would never think it was possible once you are capable, through proper observation, of um, figuring out what's reproduced and what it's not. So uh, the experiment, um, so now the issue is that can we do something about um, the, uh, uh, using that property? Now I'm thinking, okay, now we have a substrate for ecological interactions, as uh, ecologists say, that is something which you have like uh, the network structure over which you have all kinds of interactions. Fish, amphibians, humans. Mind you, humans, I won't be talking about that, but clearly the Neolithic transitions meant that whoever came up from Africa to colonize us followed rivers. Why? Because of the drinking water, because of the energy, and because of transportation. So the diffusion of human populations were not isotropic, we're absolutely anisotropic in following those fractal structures. And this has an implication of the speed of propagation of the waves of the human invasions. But back to the example I'm showing you here now. I'm showing you an example which wells on a, uh, in this case, of a sociology experiment, which statistical physics picked up and transformed in a, in a, in a wonderful manner. So what do we have, and not by chance I'm showing these two examples, one is a substrate, which is a network, that is, uh, what you're seeing here is that any node is connected through a network. That is, steepest descent in the stupid case of rivers in which gravity dominates. Water goes in the direction of where gravity tells her to do. So the steepest descent, you guys are skiers, so you know what I'm talking about if you don't remember the mathematical definition of a gradient. Whereas flatlands means that any interaction you may have, uh, I remember the booming voice of Ignacio, define interactions, I will in a minute with an example. Defined interaction is not, of course, a detail. But anyways, meaning that if you move from here to there, in, in the left thing, what you had in there, you go into only one direction. You cannot go in any direction. So two sides could be uh, formally very uh, physical in, 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 in uh, uh, bird's eye distance, but be very far away if connected from the network, what is called the chemical distance. In the second case, um, the von Neumann neighborhood that is, every first, I mean, in the four uh, connected directions, is a possible direction for you to interact, to move, or to do whatever you do. So the exercise goes as follows. It's called the voter model. And it's an interesting model that looks like that. You'll see the thing unfolding. Uh, suppose you have a distribution of colors that are political opinions. Okay? Uh, it could be anything you want, but in this case, political opinion makes sense. What you would do is just, if you take the thing, you, any palette that you have, you kill at random in a particular place, and you replace that, that, uh, that color. With what? Okay. Most of the times, with the nearest neighbor, co the color nearest neighbor, which has the largest number of, uh, of neighbors. Well, if you have equal numbers, you choose a random. Uh, and th then off you go, you do it another time, you kill it, you replace it with the uh, most frequent uh, nearest neighbor that you have. Well, this resist generalization could be not the immediate nearest neighbors up to the case in which you have this whole mean field that you get to take the average of all the things. There. But certainly if you had only that ingredient, all you would have it in the end, you're going to have only the mono-dominant thought. In the end, you're going to have analytically only one color, the color that was present 
in, uh, in, in, uh, with a largest number at the beginning of the exercise. And no model which depends from initial condition dramatically is a good model. So what um, the Volta model thought, that, um, and the other thing which is interesting is the neutral model. That is, what you have is that there's no political opinion stronger than any other. It's not that you have four guys, four green guys, and with four guys, you have three green guys and a red guy. But the red guy is really convincing. So I'll, I'll marry the red guy. No, no, no. Three guys of near neighbors are green, you become green. The change you make is a called diversification ratio, which is a well-known feature in ecology. That is, uh, once they 100,000 iterations, um, you change the thing. So you kill the thing, and you do not get one of those things. But you get a, a color that wasn't in the original panel. What happens is this. The only difference between the two is the substrate for ecological interaction. One is a network, and one is a savanna, what we called. But it's something in which everything can be. It's a completely different path. I mean, it doesn't need the phenomenal statisticians that EPFL have to characterize that uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these are different patterns, very different patterns. There's something really different there. Well, you repeat it, there's going to be different. No, it's very robust. You repeat it, and it does it all the time. And, um, and then there was, was a big, the big uh, defect. Uh, of course, neutral model. Nature is not neutral. I mean, how can you expect that biological rates don't depend on the size of the bug, the size of the animal, or the of the political opinion cannot be stronger than any other. Neutrality is anathema in each ecology, for instance. So the mathematical result, which was modestly published, etc., but didn't get any attention. So we decided, thank you to EPFL, to do it experimentally. Meaning doing experimentally means that you have to make a huge number of replicas of this with a uh, von Neumann neighborhood and with a network neighborhood. And putting those stupid well plates, um, bugs, real bugs. So we started with, with a random distribution of 21 protists of a certain kind. And doing the manual operation, because at the time we didn't have the, uh, the, the robots to do that automatically, like in, in the mighty life sciences of the PFL, they probably have in the, in the uh, in the conference room, I don't know, I'm just kidding. So uh, what we did, and so uh, we, we invaded one of those small rooms in the GC, uh, in the GC buildings, so we got these uh, replicas all over the place. Uh, I'm making a long story short, but what happens is that the result is absolutely identical to the computation done with the neutral model. These are properly replicated, etc. This, in fact, got even a prize, this paper from the biology papers, whatever, of some kind. And what happens is that the flatness, the flat world of biodiversity that you have in a system in which the system is free to, um, to, uh, uh, to interact with any of the neighbors, is a completely different from the kind of biodiversity that you have in a system in which are protected, in a sense. So the shielding provided by the network structure mind you, which is universal, in fact, is something which, which remains to be seen. And there is nothing neutral here, because I'm talking about leaving bugs. And that uh, convinced that that neutral pattern um, uh, doesn't imply neutral process, something which was uh, later recognized. So from infinitely small, from a, like a, a well plate, hundreds of well plates, and <laughs> thousands of working days of graduate students, God bless them, um, we decided to make the jump. And, and let's talk about the Mississippi River now. This is the Mississippi, one of the iconic river, river networks in the world, etc. And let me show you again one of those eyeball statistics which I adore in the lesson of my friend Ignacio Rodriguez, who said something, you have to see it and you have to like it. Then you would know that it's worth uh, doing it mathematically. What you see in here, LSR in the upper graph, color coded from uh, red colors when you have very small values to uh, blue colors when you have more, is local species richness. For um, an experimental work done by Bill Fagan, a famous biologist, uh, fish biologist, uh, collected on, uh, on fish uh, species in the Mississippi, Missouri, uh, in the Mississippi, uh, Mississippi, Missouri River system. What you see below is AARP, if you see it, I hope it's big enough, I means annual average runoff production, which is, damn it, how much water flows through the system is discharged, is total contributing area. It's the essence of a, of a, uh, of a hydrology of thing. And it doesn't take uh, a great statistician to figure out that there is a correlation. And what was interesting is that with the same idea, which came from a very 
uh, with toy model, um, and then confirmed by laboratory experiments, you can come out with exactly with the same stupid model which I showed you for the Volter model. You can reproduce alpha diversity, which is a measure of that local species diversity, against the distance from the outlet of Mississippi, Missouri, with a remarkable capability to produce what it is, what this is, including the habitat, etc. Pumping in in the process notions about geomorphology, ecology, and hydrology. Or, for that matter, I, I anticipated you, I'm, I'm, I'm quickly coming to, uh, to my conclusions because I have 30 slides, it'll be half an hour, I'm sorry for uh, pasting you with that, but as you probably imagine, I kind of like uh, those things. And so, uh, one of the interesting things, we can actually start again from what you learn at a small scale, you can apply it in, in a large scale, in fact, and this is the invasion of a zebra mussel in the uh, in the Mississippi-Missouri River Basin, which is an interesting effect because it was, um, zebra mussel is a strong competitor which has a, makes a great uh, damages, in fact, to river networks. It was injected, in fact, by ballast water of a Ukrainian cargo ship in the, one of the Great Lakes, accidentally stored into the Chicago Canal that got into, into the Mississippi-Missouri River Basin. And these, in fact, uh, the veligers, that is the larvae of those things, have a very great capability of surviving under many conditions. They started then diffusing slowly down the Mississippi River, generating with concentration, growing, generating all kinds of problems that you had in there. What is interesting is that now you bump into something which physicists call the multiplex networks and complexity, of which I will not paste you, but uh, that was uh, fun to do. Why? And complexity can explain in a simple story. What happens is that you had this thing diffusing looking at that, the mainstream Mississippi, Missouri, and all of a sudden in Kansas, you wouldn't boom, you see an outbreak like a forest fire of those zebra mussel. Uh, what happened? It, just keeping in thousands of kilometers in between. What happened is that um, recreation boats would be <laughs> going to Mississippi in the place which veligers were in there. They didn't clean properly the ballast water. They put it on a trailer. They brought it thousands of kilometers away. They put it in the water and the thing restarted. It's a mechanism which reminds about forest fires, about um, layers over layers of different uh, networks, which in fact will be interesting for my final point. And what I'm saying is that, of course, then, then again, um, we do it in the laboratory, this thing. This thing, the protistodromes, that is, you put protists to run into a system which make them one dimensional, make, and you can make actually bifurcated networks and small fractals to measure the, uh, the celerity of a propagating front. And these are the pictures that, um, that really produce effect for, um, for us. I mean, I was fascinated. For, I know that for biologists it's absolutely trivial, but, uh, but for us it was uh, finding out, seeing what was happening and getting those tracks and those pictures was very nice. And I get to my last point, what you see here is the island of Haiti, in which I'm reporting now, is, uh, it's half of the island of Hispaniola, if you read Jar and Diamond, uh, about the meta-history of how environmental factors and political factors shape the history of the history, in fact. And um, the poorest country in the world. It was struck by an earthquake in early 2010, 300,000 people died, it destroyed whatever infrastructure was remaining in the system. There's no sewer system, there's no water distribution system, there's no police, there's no road, there's no nothing in there. And we planted cholera in a place which was cholera free for 200 years. Why did we plant it, we as an as a international community? Uh, it was Nepalese um, uh, peacekeeping forces that, uh, in which there clearly there were some asymptomatic cholera uh, bearers that started uh, uh, discharging and then things started uh, generating the process, etc. But what I showed here in this graph was essentially total cumulative, uh, especially explicit, of course, total cumulative number of recorded cholera cases. Of course, let's not be merchant of doubts. Of course, cholera, total reported cholera cases doesn't mean uh, confirmed cholera cases, but still there could be an overestimation or whatever. There could be lots, lots of if, etc. But if you go at the root of the problem, um, you simply put the stupidest possible measure. You sum the total number of cases. What you see in there? You see the rivers. And why? Because obviously the substrate for ecological interaction is the fact that you set into a place the water gets collected from open air defecation sites. You're going to have, and that's again the stigma of poverty, of course. Um, they get into the main river, and the main river makes as a propagator of the system. It is the only source of water in the system, of course, so it starts propagating the invasion. And there's something more that comes into the picture. Human mobility, of course. 
Um, because you have an incubation time, because many are asymptomatic uh, bears, uh, of course, if you have a strong cholera form, you don't move because you go more than six tools per day, so you simply don't move, etc. But essentially what happens is that once you start, like zebra muscle carried out by multiplex networks generated by recreation boats, in here have a human mobility of any kind, even panic mobility, if an outbreak in the place, brings the, 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 brings the disease all over places. And, and I have to say that um, like, I'm an engineer, I'm not a doctor, etc. So one thing is working on diffusion of the fractal, and one thing is seeing uh, an epidemic in action. And this is uh, one of the hospital of Médecins Sans Frontières in, uh, in the south of the country, etc. These guys are, uh, the g girls and guys are absolutely amazing, etc. So what you see, one thing is seeing the disease in action and something moving, because what happens is that in the poor parts of the country, what you have treatment is what you see on the back left. It's a stretcher and a cut hole, and you put a bucket on top of that, and you let shed. And if you're lucky, you get the hydration which is necessary for surviving. By the way, poverty, it, it's a disaster also for the fact that initial mortality in that place um, was of the order of 8, 9 to 10 percent, whereas normally it's 1 percent. Why? Because of the stigma of, um, of cholera, the stigma of poverty. Then when you had especially old men sick, you wouldn't bring them to the nearest treatment center. You put them far away because you don't want the neighbor to see. So, again, Awareness, education, hygiene is something on which uh, we, we have to work uh, completely. But uh, long story short, what I'm saying is that you see on the left is the data. And what you see on the right, what we can do by modeling these spatially explicit models of things, which is a, an outgrowth of exactly the same model you have seen for the biodiversity. Now, is this perfect? Well, no. Is it enough to evaluate alternative in the management of emergency? by far, by far and large. And this robustness in our ability to do that is largely due to the fact of those universal features of, um, of the river networks we've been, uh, we've been uh, uh, talking about. And um, get to that, so this is a picture I took in there. This is what the market of Carrefour um, in the outskirts of Port-au-Prince, again, I told you, uh, at the peak of a cholera infection in the poorest country in the world, in which, by, after recovering from a disastrous earthquake, you got uh, this, um, this uh, epidemic of cholera. This is the market. And by the way, Carrefour, um, the fortunes go up and down. I keep telling my students, mind you, remember that we're talking about climatic, social, economic fortunes for ups and downs. If you look at the driest um, place on Earth, it's a certain part of a Sahel desert in which there hasn't been a single drop of water, of, of rainfall in the last 32 years. Not a drop of water in 32 years. If you look at it from far away, you will see former teeming rivers passing through that region. So, mind you, fortune doesn't last forever. But at that time, um, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton got their reception at Carrefour for their wedding. So it was a, a, like a place in which you go for vacation and a thriving economy or something like that. So the fortunes go up and down with the, with the ability of a man, etc. But what I'm sh um, showing you, and I'm getting to the, just a few observations, I'm, I'm coming to my end very quickly. You see that running water, what you see in there, is what you have in there normally. And that's the water that will be taken and used by the households, actually. That water that you see on the upper right corner, etc., cetera, uh, passing through, uh, uh, through uh, 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 garbage of all kinds. Or um, is this um, uh, safe water? Now, the guy is, is, is handing you the, the bottle um, with the, his hands. And, um, well, that's a way of communicating. Uh, uh, so human-to-human -human infection is a big, big source of infection too, in fact. But this is my last slide. And it's um, one of the last um, reflection I, I want, to, uh, uh, I want to, uh, to bring in here. Is that... Uh, um, I like to take pictures, of course, and, um, and this is not good, but what happened so quickly that I wouldn't be able to, and by the way, I was, uh, because of the courtesy of Terre des Hommes, who brought us, etc., we are in armed uh, cars, protected, because they could kill you, because there's no police, there's no road, essentially, but to go to faraway places, you have to, because there's no highways, there's no water distribution system, tap water doesn't exist in the place, and, and uh, so, they could kill you to steal your camera, in fact. 
But what happens if you look at that um, red-dressed uh, young lady? Um, in a second, what she did, she pulled up a Nokia 1900, showed a proof of payment to that lady, then I got the cabbage in return. And that's, that's curious. So is it possible that in a country, the poorest country in the world, there's no inroads for safe water distribution, but everybody has a cellular phone? The ownership of a cellular phone is not socially biased at all in 99% of the south of the world. And that tells not about them, it talks about us on the fact we haven't been able to regulate that. So this proliferation of inequalities is very peculiar because when the capital decides to, to get inroads, of it, they do it. And so, and so that's part of our reflection uh, on how we should be operating. So my conclusions are uh, the small discovery for which I'm grateful I will, uh, to have received this prize was the fact that this particular um, robustness, this universality of the features of river networks, which had been discovered uh, earlier on, I was one of the, uh, one of the persons that worked on that, etc. but he wasn't the only one, and for which Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe got the Stockholm Water Prize in 2002, um, endowed processes occurring on those networks, which have certain features, certain robustness features, and, and talking about species, about populations, about pathogens, they endow us with the possibility of making reasonable prediction about the ecosystem services they provide and, and um, a reasonable uh, scenario for uh, looking forward and examining alternatives. So my take, and that's, um, that's uh, my conclusion, is that um, time is ripe for um, rethinking, radically rethinking distributed justice when it comes to water resources management. And... Um, and um, and, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, by far and large, by reducing inequalities on a global scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this brilliant presentation. Yeah. Let me get some water. <laughs> I know I talk too much. I know, I know. So thank, thank you for your presentation and congratulations again on receiving the Stockholm Water Prize. Your research and your lectures make an immense impact and it is difficult to fully express all my admiration, but I think we can emphasize a special thank you to, for inspiring us all. I am Marc Antoine, a student in Master of environmental sciences and engineering. And I would like to specialize in the domain of water resources. Um, so we will have a short interview and then everyone can come to the microphones here and here to ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with um, your personal experience. Um, when you received the prize, who did you think about Personally, um, you're a great source of motivation for, for my colleagues and myself. So, in your case, um, can you tell us about the mentors, the colleagues, the teammates that have greatly inspired you? It's, it's a, thank you so much for the kind words. And uh, this is a beautiful question. Yes, well, uh, I've shown in particular my, my dearest friend. It was the first thing that... Um, came to mind when uh, the, the, the call from Stockholm came. It was a funny thing, I'll tell you, when I have a bar in case, how it came, because I was on the train in the place in which um, connection got on and off from Domodossola to Milan. So I got a part of a phone, but I was <laughs> so I wasn't sure that I understood properly. But the first um, 
thought was for Ignacio Rodriguez de Uber, who passed away like a few months ago, whose uh, uh, ceremony in 2002 I attended, and so I have vividly in the mind of that, and uh, the regret uh, for a great man. And as, as I said, my personal conviction is that the best um, hydrologist ever that ever existed. But uh, I've been the good fortune of, um, of uh, 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 knowing well a few other winners. Uh, one is Wilfried Brutzert, good friend of ours, who is visiting professor here uh, at, at the PFL when Marc Parlange was the dean. He got it last year. Gideon Dagan, a very good friend of mine, got it in 1987, and uh, master of contemporary thought on, uh, on groundwater hydrology. And Pete Eagleson, who passed away a few years back, um, earlier on, a good friend of mine, great, inspiring things, etc. All I have to say is that um, this wouldn't have been possible again without EPFL, that's clear. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say that, that openly, of course, uh, in, in other places, etc., especially. I don't want to hurt my alma mater, which I remain attached very much, actually. But the research infrastructure and the quality of the students that we could get here, uh, however passionate about the thing, etc., made all the difference. So it is something which uh, I really owe to EPFL. And the journey goes on and on. The journey goes on. I, I don't think, well, I, I will be retired. I'm already, on, as, as you may know, I'm already on an extension because I'm, I'm going to turn 70 next uh, September and I'll be retiring, definitely. I'm not sure I'll be ready to give up my, my stupid exercises. So I may, I may find a place somewhere else. But <laughs> How did your vision of water resources and ecosystem functioning evolve in time. And in the development of eco-hydrology, what are the various disciplines involved? It's a good question. And in part, um, Andrew answered to that in his uh, lovely presentation. What happened is that you were reading um, uh, super interesting papers of ecology, for instance, was studying about uh, uh, even, even, I mean, refined mathematical objects, stochastic differential equations, and uh, and things of this kind, dated by theoretical ecologists, you, you take your hat off. Most of them are, in fact, mathematicians by training, so much better than us. But then you would get that, for instance, the forcing was something which, okay, here's the Gaussian noise or whatever, etc. Once you realize that that's rainfall, rainfall is not Gaussian. <laughs> we knew very well, because we've been measuring for hundreds of years. Padua started measuring um, daily precipitation in 1721, and he's been doing that ever since. So. But it was obvious there was a margin for improving, for improving that view that uh, however good they were, I said, look, guys, if you're talking about species, I'd be listening. If you're talking about rain, you listen to me. So that was a stimulus to uh, start studying well what the colleges had done and then pouring in some knowledge, etc. And the thing started developing and eco-hydrology was born. Eco-hydrology means water control, controls on living communities. Okay, so be them any kind of species, whatever, populations, pathogens, or whatever, which is the, the essence of that. Water controls means that, uh, I mean, not all biodiversity is water controlled, of course. Much of it could be nutrient controlled or many other things like that. But a hell of a lot of it is. And there's no excuse for not using what we alert about those carriers of all things, the processes reflected in water through the river network. Why? Because it gives predictability. It gives our, us the possibility of putting a price tag on the ecosystem services, which was unheard of, compelling, replicable. There's no excuse for not doing that today, at least in my hope. I see. So in terms of predictability, how do we make predictions? And in a model, real observation data is used to validate the accuracy of our predictions. But with changing conditions, precipitations becoming less frequent, more intense, less predictable. What is the reference for making models of the upcoming changes in climate and hydrology? This is a very good question. But, um, I would be content in saying that uh, models do not do predictions. They just offer scenarios. It's more reasonable to say that because when you say predictions means this will happen and you know how many uncertainties you have in the process. It makes way more sense to see that, okay, if these are the conditions, this is what will happen. And this generates scenarios that are super useful for a number of things, for deciding what to do, for deciding use of resources and, uh, and all kinds of things of this kind. And then, but yet what I'm saying is that, and 
to ecologists back and forth, engineers have a hell of a lot of tools. I'm talking to environmental engineers like you in particular. Uh, we have a hell of a lot of tools uh, to understand how to treat uncertainty, how to calibrate parameter, but by each framework I've been pasting you with the classes. And, and so, but is there's something in which the, the, what we call it, in a sense, the theory of models. When you get people that started um, without a proper upbringing in this theory of models, which is typically an engineering, an engineering domain, and they start making uh, clearly over-parameterized uh, models, clearly without a sense whether what they're doing has any sense or not. You know that uh, it's in a turf in which next generation science in this field will require all the tools of ecologists and all the tools of the engineers, in fact. That's why, in fact, it, it's, it's taking out. So there's a hell of a lot of opportunities for environmental engineers, in my view, even in, in, even in epidemiology. That's great. So now, with all these tools, um, let's talk more about e ecosystem services themselves. To summarize, we have water availability for uh, domestic use, agricultural use, hydropower, recreational, um, also sanitation and hygiene protection of floods and, and droughts. So what are the typical conflicts of interests? And is the ecosystem management a way to both maybe solve the conflicts and also, well, address the... Well, let, let me, biodiversity let me rehearse with... Uh, no, it's, it's a beautiful question. And, and um, let, me, let me go back to one of the examples I showed. Will we be able to decide, for instance, to avoid um, the construction of an irrigation network in the light of uh, the disease that it could bring, in fact, to a certain thing? Et now, first, you have to be able to predict in a compelling way how many cases you're going to have. So that's what but this has been done. Will we be able to do that? It's a different story. You have to convince people that you're not, uh, you're not uh, bullshitting. And, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a serious thing. So the idea, this pricing the environment, something we care very much for, unless we give a proper value to the natural capital. So this, the ecosystem services you get for free now, and you give for granted, like drinkable water, like you said, all these things, until we price them properly. We won't be able to protect them as we should. Okay. So before giving um, the microphones to other people, is there a piece of advice that you have carried with you throughout your career? And that should be heard by students starting out in environmental engineering. My dearest um, uh, 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 students in environmental engineering, and uh, which I'll be seeing for the last time, they're going to have like uh, only two semesters remaining. The first one is that um, well, it's a different. It's a give me a responsibility. Huh? <laughs> okay. The first thing that I can tell you is a regular thing which happens um, uh, as as. Um, uh, you may remember in class that we say that, uh, of course, you guys don't have time to read books, but in case, and I was giving you mm. titles of books. And so la, the, the first thing is that finding out in your career, professional, academic, or whatever, you will not be measured by the number of projects you begin, but by the number of projects you finish. And my recommendation is that um, teach yourself, force yourself to write and think clearly, and to uh, communicate in a precise manner uh, with strength and, uh, and, uh, and loudly. And uh, be independent. Be curiosity-driven. Let your fantasy grow. That's my... And, 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 and dominate. You can do that. You'll find always professor that allow you to. Thank you so much. Please, if you have questions. You're intimidating. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. It's a very important person asking questions. Paola Vigano, my dear friend. Cara Paola. Um, Andrea, thanks a lot for, the, um, for your um, speech. And of course, congratulations for this fantastic prize. Uh, I want to use this moment to ask you what you think about the future of the Venice Lagoon. <laughs> what a beautiful question. Uh, 
you're talking, once you're talking about, talking about ecosystem services, okay, Lagoon provides a fundamental ecosystem service of all kinds, etc. What we know is that uh, in 100 years, it'll be gone. The regional projections of the International Panel for Climate Change, the regional projections, uh, say that um, you're going to have, of course, merchants of doubt could tell us, yes, but it's unsure that it's going to be the low end of the up end, etc. But in the most likely scenario, it means in about 100 years, um, you're going to have one meter of mean sea level um, in, that, in that neighborhood. And what it means is that um, Venice won't be unless we, we act. Because one meter more, I'm talking to an urbanist, the, the texture of a city won't survive for a number of reasons. Of course, in the past, what you see those buildings, you're also an architect, so, and I'm not, so you could contradict me. But uh, you remember that there was those uh, white uh, seals that you had surrounding the things that uh, was history a stone, was essentially a, a, a way of stopping the capillary rise of salt water. Uh, once that is passed, and that's long past in many places, etc., there's nothing would uh, deteriorate so rapidly the masonry, the structure of a city, that the beauty, the work of art, that, um, that uh, uh, the world admires will be gone. And mind you, that in the past, it was traditional. You would destroy, just throw it away, use the, 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 the material of the demolition to put it at a higher elevation and reconstruct, which I doubt is going to be what we have to do at this point. The second thing is that um, uh, uh, the, about the, the, the complicated relationship with the, with the sea is the fact that um, it took us 60 years to converge and to build those flood barriers, which is conceptually, uh, it was technically such an obvious solution, but there was no alternative to the interruption of the sea, uh, to the exchange of the sea and, and the lagoon to, uh, to protect the city from storm surges. And uh, with a meter more, uh, it means that uh, you have to close with the current uh, uh, regulations, maybe 260, 280 w times a year. So for one, there won't be any port activity, any significant port activity left. Not only, not only that, all those cultural ecosystems, uh, residual land, tidal landforms, etc., will be gone. So it means that the moment to start thinking, now to 80 years, and it's intergenerational because I won't be there. I mean, my young guys could be there, I said, I'm talking about 100 years from now. So we're saying that the moment to act and to start thinking radical new solutions to how to approach that, and, um, and you know how much I care for, for uh, 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 your insight into, I want to see ideas for a thriving Venice 100 years from now, meaning with a meter more sea level rise, which would be 80 or 120. A radical new thinking is necessary. And the, uh, the thinking, the ways of the urbanists are the way forward, in my view. I told you, you know that, how I feel. Thank you for your question, anyways, Paolo. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you Hello, for sir. <laughs> thank you for the pre presentation. Uh, you talked briefly uh, about beauty uh, during your pre presentation, and uh, I would be... Talking about what, excuse me? Uh, beauty, a beauty, the notion of yes. beauty, and uh, I would be really interested in knowing uh, how we could do to uh, put some more information on the pricing of beauty in the ecosystems and how you would consider this problem or this question. That's a very good question. First, you have um, to fight prejudice that putting a price tag is something which you don't do. If you don't do that, I mean, you lose it. Second, beauty, I mean, look, if you go and uh, rent a, 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 an apartment in Sensual Peace, whether it looks the, the lake or it looks the parking lot, you have a different value. What's the difference? Beauty, even the apartment is exactly the same. So, s shall we, in a way, codify our thinking about beauty? And about, by the way, and about a fair access to beauty for all, not only for some. I, I'm... I'm really convinced that the reduction of inequalities, meaning has, let's say, the haves and the have-nots, um, is something which, of course, I'm, you, I'm biased. I look matters mostly from a perspective of the south of the world. But not that the north of the world is devoid of problems or inequalities or any other issues, etc. So, <laughs> 
I wish I had an answer for you, a, a precise answer. I do not have it. I know that we have to force ourselves to find the, and, and consider beauty as a cultural service which enters the evaluation of costs and uh, benefits of actions of collective and public interest. It's a good question anyway. I know I don't, didn't answer because I don't have an answer, frankly. So the answer is, I don't know. Yes, I survived, it seems. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Yeah. So much, my Thank friend. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well done. Thank you.